All right, guys, so we had some questions come up about uh, uh, port size, velocity, and, and, and flow bench. So I thought I would talk about this because I haven't really um, dove into it too deep. I've covered it with other um, uh, calculations with minimal cross-sectional error explaining the port needs to be the right size. But what I thought I'd do is just explain um, two, two areas because we had a question in our YouTube series about um, should I focus on flow over velocity when it uh, comes to forced induction? And again, um, the, the simple answer is no, and we'll get into why. But um, first I wanted to cover uh, this misconception that a flow bench can tell you what size your port needs to be. So I've done a, a diagram up on the board uh, with three different minimal cross-sectional areas, which will, which will obviously influence the same ratio of average. So even if you want to look at it as average areas, uh, same sort of thing. So we've got the blue, black, and the red. The port's just made bigger um, each time. So we've got a, a two inch on the blue line, we've got a 2.2 average on the black, and we've got a 2.4 on the red, either MCA or average, whatever you want to do. I'm not talking specific numbers. It's more about understanding uh, the concept here. So the same thing will apply, doesn't matter what size uh, cylinder head you got. But from the red to the black to the blue, if we were doing velocity targets on a flow bench, there'd be zero difference. Uh, the only difference we're gonna see is in our flow figures, because obviously we've got different size valves, different size throats, and different size volume ports. So uh, obviously the bigger volume port is gonna flow better. There, there might be little localized differences, but on average, um, the velocity in all three of those ports is pretty much gonna be exactly the same if the shape's the same. If we just morph the shape slightly, um, like uh, you can do in like the Rottler machines and stuff like that, you can just, once you design a good port, you can just change uh, how much volume's in it, uh, simple stuff like that. So. I thought I'd use this as an example to show you why a flow bench isn't going to tell you the size. Um, obviously, uh, the red is going to flow the best, but this is where our minimal cross-sectional area calculations come into it to find out what our, our dynamic airspeed is. And I, I still see some people getting confused uh, about our minimal cross-sectional area calculations, you can't measure that on a flow bench. What that is is a calculation uh, using your RPM, your cubic capacity, and the tightest part in your induction system to see where uh, it falls as far as uh, airspeed goes. And it should be between that six and 700 feet per second, again, depending on what you're doing with it. So that's the key to making sure that we're on the horsepower hump. Meaning if our airspeed's too low, we won't horsepower, we won't torque. The engine will just be flat across the dyno. It'll feel horrible. Um, you'll have fueling issues, all sorts of problems. Uh, and if it's the minimum cross-sectional area is too small, uh, our torque will peak really, really quickly and our horsepower will nose over. So you'll torque, but you won't horsepower. The perfect minimal cross-sectional area is when we get the balance of both, at horsepower and at torque. Because remember, torque is a cal uh, horsepower is a calculation of torque. Again, we don't measure horsepower, we calculate it off torque, uh, 5252 five, divided, that's why they cross at 5252, five, right? So the better we can carry torque and the better we make it in the area we need, the more it's gonna influence the horsepower where we need. So, and we've talked about the separation window being 1500 to 2000 RPM after peak torque is where peak power should be, roughly. Uh, and the better the port uh, and the better, um, you know, the, the streamlining aspects and everything that goes into it, uh, the, the, the more, the higher port efficiencies the broader we can make that window. Uh, and even with EFI, you'll see that'll be a bit broader than Carby, but that, that that's the key right there. Um, making sure we size the port to the engine. So again, and again, this is where flow benches will lead you up the garden path if you're not focusing on the size. Uh, and like I've talked about uh, in our porting series, understanding that CSA gradient um, we could take um, 
the blue port, which is the smallest port, put a 208 valve in it and it's going to flow better. It's going to look better on the flow bench. But it's going to be horrible on the engine. Uh, you, 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 the, the sudden change in cross-sectional area is going to kill the, your discharge coefficient. It's going to be horrible. The head, it's just not going to work, right? So this is where we've got to look at everything uh, as one system. This is why I always talk about the primary induction system looking at as one piece. Don't just look at the cylinder head. Look at the total in primary induction system because that works as one. The waves, the sound of speed, everything that moves up and down that uh, runner moves from the valve seat to the plenum opening. So look at look at the whole system as one. But yeah, I thought I'd just do this one to highlight um, how we can have the same velocities but different size ports. So and we'll, we will see it in flow numbers, but we won't see it in velocity. Um, and the other um, comment that came up was um, prioritizing flow numbers over velocity. And to me, that that's a no-no, especially with boosted engines. In fact, I'll always uh, side on the small size, and I'll explain why, because there's a couple of mechanisms that come into this. And you'll see this with boosted engines that are too big. They tend to chase horsepower as we put more boost in, where if we get ahead on size, they tend to flatline and just carry power. Um, so, and the reason they'll do this is to do with that boundary layer mechanism we're talking about. So we know that if the minimal cross-sectional area is too small, um, the, the speed through that, the dynamic speed, so as the valve's opening, closing, and the air accelerates through there, we get a depreciation of our density, meaning we're creating too much heat because there's too much uh, intermolecular collision in that minimal cross-sectional area. And then the boundary layer swells as well. We have that working against us. Because remember, again, as we've talked about, as density drops, uh, as velocity goes up, density and pressure drop relative, right? As it accelerates through that minimal cross-sectional area, because the pressure is lower in the minimal cross-sectional area, so the airspeed, so our localized pressure and density is lower, the boundary layer will thicken. Now, when we look at a boost engine, it can actually artificially control the boundary layer. And this is why we can tend to um, side on the smaller sides of um, our minimum cross-sectional area calculations with boosted engines. And that's because we have far more density and a greater pressure differential to control that boundary layer, meaning that Say at uh, 600 feet through the thing, we're losing 10% of our pressure. Well, not that it's that great. I'm just using rough numbers, guys. Now that we've got, say, 40 or 50 PSI pressure, the, the pressure differential, so if, if we lose 10% off, uh, say, 500, we're, we're looking at you know, 45 PSI, whatever it is. So it's only a slight reduction in pressure. So that boundary layer pressure doesn't tend to grow as far. So the boundary layer is controlled far better in, in a multiple atmosphere engine. So something we're putting bigger and bigger and boot, um, boost levels in, the, the, the um, boundary thickness won't actually swell with RPM. It, it'll stay the same or even compress slightly. So um, that's an aspect we have to look at. Uh, so yeah, I definitely don't like to optimize for flow in a boosted engine. Uh, I'll go on size or if anything, slightly smaller. Uh, and I think that's sort of, uh, my targets on boosted type stuff is even though I'm on the lower side of the minimal cross-sectional area, so like 620s rather than some of the high numbers we see in some rural race two-valve heads or restricted series, but the rest of the port I don't put a lot of taper in. So my average velocity through that port, so when we actually put it on a flow bench, the average velocity will be much higher, even though the minimal cross-sectional area is, um, or what I choose, is bigger. Um, that's because I'm trying not to give away as much temperature through the minimal cross-sectional area. But there's there's different ways to do it. And you know, you can you can target 
your 640s give it a little bit more taper and you're almost going to see the same sort of averages. The difference I find, uh, and you, you see this in more, more direct shot, more the twin cams, they tend to carry power better because we don't have as much change in our cross-sectional area. So our port energy will be more and we seem to, we seem to see that in horsepower and torque numbers. And by that I mean if you've got a minimal cross-sectional area at uh, 2.4 uh, and you've got a, a valve area at 3, the amount of uh, deceleration that's going on there and the extra molecular collision, because you've got to remember as the air slows down, the air that's behind it coming fast will start to collide into it. This is why our discharge coefficient is so important. You can develop the best port in the world. If the chamber doesn't support the port, it will look horrible on the flow bench because those air molecules have nowhere to go once they come through the valve seat that is colliding into each other. So if you've got a really, really shrouded valve, same thing. This is why when we deshroud, we see uh, better numbers on the flow bench. That's because we're not colliding. The air coming out of the um, out of the valve seat, that conical cone, uh, isn't colliding with stationary air. Same thing as why an engine won't make horsepower without pipes on it. If we just pull the pipes off and run the engine on the dyno, that air that's coming out is hitting stationary air, right? And that's going to bank up and slow the engine. Like I've said, not only don't we want back pressure in a, an exhaust manifold, we want less than atmospheric. So that way that pipe can create a negative pressure and help pull that out. So the high pressure in the engine is going to fill the lower than even atmospheric pressure, right? And that's the key. And, and the better it does it, uh, with with a pressure differential, with the less collisions we have, the less density we lose, the more efficient everything becomes. So um, yeah, hopefully that clears that up because I've seen that come up a lot of times. I get this question uh, time and time again, especially when it comes to boosted, uh, should I prioritize flow over velocity? Uh, my, my answer every time is no. Focus on that velocity, focus on that port energy, and, um, you know, the best cylinder head guys in the world will tell you a really, really good NA head is a really, really good boosted head almost every single time. So there you go, guys. Cheers.